الحمد لله رب العالمين الصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته إن شاء الله تعالى the sound is good connection is good everybody can hear me and see me بإذن الله تعالى before we get started uh, we don't want to waste any uh, precious and valuable time in explaining the text while you guys can't hear me or can't see me for whatever reason. Inshallah, everybody's well, everybody's good. The brothers and the sisters um, outside of North America or outside of this hemisphere, inshallah ta'ala, um, hopefully it's a good time for you. And the brothers and sisters in the United States or Canada or Central America uh, or other parts, give or take an hour or two hours, Eastern, Western um, uh, time zones, Hopefully you can watch the class uh, tomorrow after Fajr on your way to work or something on your way to school unless you're a night owl and you're up and you're not sleeping. Bidnilahi ta'ala. All right. All right, so inshallah we good. Abu Mesa, we good? I can say I'm not allowed to have a cat on. All right. So the last thing that we went over in the last class, if I'm not mistaken, we're in Kitab al uh, and it isn't a very long chapter. There are only two hadiths. That Hafidh bin Hajar, may Allah have mercy upon him, mentions only two hadiths with regards to Kitab al Raja, the chapter of taking one's wife back. So, before we get started where we left off last week's class, we were explaining some of the fundamental principles, some of the main issues with regards to Raja, its ruling, its legality. Do you have to have witnesses? Is raja'a only with a statement? Can it be with an action? Does the action have to be accompanied by an intention? Naam? What are some of those acts and actions that will automatically count as raja'a, even without the intention? What is the ruling on a man having intercourse with his uh, wife who is in the idda period? Naam? Taking her back out of the idda period with or without her consent with or without her father or her parents or her wali's consent. Naam. We explained all of that as well. Naam. And if I'm not mistaken, the last issue that we went over was when Sanani, rahimahullah ta'ala, the commentator says, وَاخْتُلِفَ هَلْ يَجِبُ عَلَيْهِ إِعْلَامُهَا بِأَنُّهُ قَدْ رَاجَعَهَا لِأَلَّا تَزَوَّجْ غَيْرَهُ Does a man have to tell his wife that he has taken her back or not. And some of the consequences of not doing that with regards to a woman remarrying. And of course, uh, not among all Muslims today, not even all non-Muslims, but many Muslims, one may argue, may say most, um, in light of cultural Islam, quote unquote, when a woman gets divorced, uh, Getting married is the last thing on her mind. It's totally looked down upon. Uh, some fathers or some guardians, they won't allow their daughters to remarry, period. Or if a woman wants to remarry, um, they'll look at her as being dirty or unchaste. She's a whore, okay? Uh, she has the hots. You're just dying to get remarried. You just got divorced. Uh, you know, have some, some pity, have some shame. Your children aren't ready, etc., etc. Uh, a woman who's uh, divorced is looked down upon in society. She's condemned forever uh, to, to a life of loneliness, a life of Allah knows best what else. Or some people, they go to the other extreme and they'll allow their daughters to get married after they've been divorced, after they've lost their virginity, after, after they've had children. They were in a long relationship marriage, five years, six years, three years. They won't even care if she remarries. Um, and many people have told me this. You know, like, you don't even need a wali. Khalas, just tell us when you've done it. And this is unfortunate. And things were very different in the time of the Sahaba. 
the early Muslims, in which if you make a careful, uh, if you carefully look at the Quranic ayat and hadith, the prophetic hadith, you'll see and you'll find that most of the rulings pertaining to marriage and divorce are geared around a woman going right back into marriage. She has to wait a menstrual cycle. She has to wait three menstrual cycles. She has to wait three months. She has to do this. She has to make sure she's not pregnant, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the mindset is very, very, very extremely different of now versus then. The Muslims at large, let alone the Arabs, or those who say or who claim that they are Arabs, so it's like night and day, all right, with regards to remarriage, a woman who's divorced, a woman who's a widow, a woman who has children, a man who is divorced, so on and so forth. All right, so we should be mindful of that. Khairan, inshallah ta'ala. So therefore, does a man have to tell her that he's taking her out of the idda period? If she has no intention on getting remarried, then what's the big deal? Versus, as soon as this man divorces me, and as soon as I'm done my three menstrual cycles, or my three pure cycles, khalas, it's time to get remarried. Because marriage is a need. Marriage is a necessity. Marriage is a major benefit. It's a part of my deen. And it isn't something which is just cultural, as it has become today. I mean, you know, Muslims are like this as well. Uh, and of course, the ease of life, the luxury of life, the availability of different products and services, which were very hard to come by back in the day. A woman needed a man. And of course, a man needed a woman. Not like today, I can um, uh, order out, I can Uber Eats, I can catch an Uber, I can have a car, a truck delivered to my front door. I can have someone come, do this service, perform this service, get rid of that, get rid of that, uh, fix this, clean this, buy this, I can order food, I can order this, I can fulfill my sexual desires, just like that, have someone come to my door, just like that, ultra convenience. Things were very, very different back in the day, let alone burying children, having children, uh, breastfeeding children, suckling children. It was a necessity. Men had to be married, women had to be married. They needed each other. And perhaps this is one of the reasons why their lives were of higher quality and their lives were more meaningful and their lives were better is because these people were on the natural sunnah way. How Allah Azzawajal made things to be, not a woman living years out of her life without a man, a man living years out of his life without a woman, a brother is in the prime of his youth, the prime of his youth, and he's not married. A woman is in the prime of her youth. Her fertility is at its peak, and she's going to school, working, or just, you know, doing nothing. And then people that want to get married later on, 30, 35, 40, 45, 50, that's a problem, a big problem. Whether it be career, whether it be sports, whether it be culture, whether it be the father saying no, whatever the issue may be, right? Allah Mustan. All right. Khair inshallah ta'ala. What happens if a woman remarries and she didn't know that she was out of the Idda period? We mentioned that as well. Khair inshallah ta'ala. Moving forward. This argument with regards to does he have to tell her or not, should he tell her or not, etc. Now. Let's move forward to the next hadith of the chapter, inshallah. On the last hadith of the chapter, Hafiz bin Hajar, rahimahullah ta'ala, he says, وَعَنِ بِنِ عُمَرَ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْهُمَا أَنَّهُ لَمَّا طَلَّقَ مْرَأَتَهُ فَقَالَ النَّبِيُّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَسَلَّمَ لِعُمَرْ مُرْهُ فَلْيُرَاجِعْهَا مُتَفَقٌ عَلَيْهِ Hadith number 929, is narrated by Ibn Umar radiallahu anhuma when he divorced his wife the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said to Umar command him to take her back and this hadith is agreed upon there's not much uh, more to say about this hadith why this hadith has been uh, completely explained in the chapter of talaq and the reason why Hafiz bin Hajar is repeating it here 
is that the Prophet وسلم, said, Murhu, fell. He commanded someone to command Ibn Umar to take his wife back. To take his wife back. With regards to the, the legality and with regards to the obligation of, or not necessarily the obligation, excuse me, but um, with regards to the command to make the raj'ah. To make the raj'ah, alright? Taking her back. And obviously that was done, as we explained in detail, with regards to the talaq that was done incorrectly. Talaq of bid'ah that Abdullah bin Umar, may Allah be pleased with him and his father, had fell into. The Messenger of Allah Wasallam was informed about it and he said, Murhu, tell him to take her back. And the scholars of Islam, they differ on understanding this hadith. Is it mandatory for the man who has divorced his wife with the incorrect way? The talaq bid'ah, the wrong way of talaq, does he have to take her back or not? Obviously, if a man divorces his wife in the correct manner, he is not required to take her back. We explained that. Khairan inshallah ta'ala. All right. Let's move forward to the next chapter. Next chapter, Hafid bin Hajar, he says, Babu al-ila wa al-dhihar wa al-kiffa. Al-ila'u huwa lughatan al-halaf wa shara'an al-imtina'u bil-imini min wat al-zawja wa al-dhiharu bi kasr al-dha'i mushtaqun min al-dhahri. Awla al-qa'ili anti alayya ki dhahri ummi. Wa al-kaffaratu hiya min al-takfiri al-taghtiya. So now he discusses the next chapter, which is in a separate book, or rather this is um, interesting here because it says Kitab, and then afterwards it says Bab. In the English translation, it's a whole entire separate Kitab. What's important is this section is not dealing with uh, the specifics of Raja, but it's dealing with another type or other types of divorce and fixing those other types of divorce. And these three issues, he says, Al-ilah, wal-dihar, wal-kafara. Number one is that which is called Al-ilah. Ila. Number two, Al-dihar. Al-dihar. And number three, Al-kafara. Al-kafara. So Al-ilah, which basically means a, an oath. Swearing, halif, to swear. That's what it linguistically means. And in the sharia, in the technical sense, in the fiqh sense, it means a man swearing not to have sexual intercourse with his wife. Period. He swears by Allah that he won't touch her, that he won't sleep with her. As far as al-dihar, then al-dihar is taken from dhahar, which means one's back, one's backside, one's rear end, posterior, one's, one's back, dhahar. And what's meant by it in the deen, or in the Arab culture, is a man saying to his wife, Anti alayya ke dhahri ummi. To me, you're no different than my mother's back. Meaning, just like I can't have ancestral relations with my mother or sister, nor can I sleep with you. So a man is basically declaring that the wife is unlawful to him, prohibited to him. He cannot go near her, he cannot sleep with her because of him making her equal and uh, paralleling her to one of his mahadim, one of his mahram female family members, right? And as far as al-kafara, then al-kafara comes from the word takfir. Kafara you kafiru, like kufr. And what's meant by that is taghtiya, is to hide something. We know that the word kufr linguistically means to hide something, to put something under something, to cover something up. So the kafara being the atonement, al kafara being the expiation, the thing that you have to do or say or pay to fix what wrong you have done. All right? That's what's meant by. Al Kifar. Everybody clear on that? Inshallah ta'ala. Tayyip. All right, let's move forward.
All right. Then says, An Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha qalat, Ala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam min nisaihi wa haram, Faja'ala al-harama halala, Waja'ala lil-yameeni kafaratan, Arwahu tilmidhiyu, Warwatu hu thiqat. قال الصنعاني رحمه الله رجح الترمذي إرساله على وصله. so says here in the English translation in the footnotes it says إِلَى means to make a vow that one is not going to maintain any kind of relation with his wife or to say her says here to say her directly. Swearing by Allah that no relation will be maintained with her in the future or in the future. Allah Azza wa Jal has prescribed four months period to restore the relationship. It is better to revive the relationship by paying expiation for the oath within prescribed period. Otherwise, divorce will be will befall by itself, or according to others, man will be compelled to divorce her, divorce or to bring back the relations to normal again. So what's meant by that is, we'll explain that. We'll just read in here what's available in English. Dhihar is derived from the word dhahar, meaning back, making resemblance between one's wife and mother from back. This is a figure of speech in Arabic language to say that you are my mother and unlawful for me for marriage. According to Sharia term, dhihar means giving resemblance to one's wife and to one's mother and making her unlawful for oneself. It is not considered divorce in Sharia, but one has to expiate for it before re-going to his wife. Its expiation is free is to free a slave, or to fast for 60 days respectfully, or to feed 60 poor persons. One has to bear compulsory one of these punishments. Kafara means making atonement for either of the above cases. Khairan insha'Allah ta'ala. So the first hadith of the chapter is narrated by Aisha radiallahu anha. Allah's Messenger وسلم, swore that he would stay away from his wives for a period and had made something unlawful for himself. Then he made it lawful and he made atonement for breaking an oath. This hadith is reported by a tirmidhi and its narrators are reliable. Once more, narrated Aisha, Allah's Messenger swore that he would stay away from his wives for a period and had made something unlawful for himself. Then he made it lawful, and he made atonement for breaking an oath. And this hadith is reported by Tirmidhi, and its narrators are reliable. So the first issue dealing with this hadith is its authenticity. The commentator mentions is that Imam Tirmidhi, half of Tirmidhi, he declared that this hadith is defective meaning it is not authentic, it's defective. And the reason behind it being defective is that there is an illa khafiya. There's a hidden defect, and that hidden defect is al-ikhtilafu fi waslihi wa irsalihi ma kawn al-mursal arjah. Is that the, the narratives, they differed. They reported it in different manners, different ways, different variations between it being in a full connected chain or being in a broken chain in which a tabi'i is attributing something to the Prophet ﷺ. Once more, reading this speech shows us the dire necessity of understanding, studying, memorizing those small books on mustalahul hadith, hadith terminology. Whether it be al manduma al baykuniya or whether it be Nukhbat al-Fikr, or whether it be Taysir, Mustalah al-Hadith, or whether it be at tadhkira fi ulum al-hadith, etc. Whatever small basic book it may be. All right, what's meant by mursal? What's the, what is a mursal hadith? What's meant by mursal? So basically, we have two sets of narrators here. One group or one versus a group, whatever the case may be. He narrates it in a chain. Fulan, 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 sahabi, rasul said it or did it, Aisha. And another, or others, they narrated 
is that someone who did not meet the Prophet, a tabi'i, directly narrated from the Prophet. Who's missing? Is it just Aisha? Is it another tabi'i? We don't know. So therefore, in theory, it becomes weak. So that's the first issue with regards to this hadith, as the scholars, uh, 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 such as the Tirmidhi, rahimahullah ta'ala, saying that it is mursal, and if it's mursal, then it's mu'al. It's da'if and it's extremely weak. That's first and foremost. And Hafid bin Hajar, rahimahullah ta'ala, he said, وَرْوَاتُهُ thiqat." He says, its narrators are trustworthy, not say it's sahih, absolutely. Wallahu ta'ala alam. Sanani rahimahullah ta'ala, he says, وَالْحَدِيثُ دَلِيرٌ عَلَى جَوَازِ حَلْفِ الرَّجُلِ مِنْ زَوْجَتِهِ وَلَيْسَ فِي تَصْلِيهٌ بِالْإِلَاءِ الْمُصْطَلْحَةِ عَلَيْهِ فِي عُرْفِ الشَّرْعِ وَالْحَلَفُ مِنْ وَطْئِ الزَّوْجَةِ وَعَلَمْ أَنْهَا اخْتَرَفَتْ الرِّوَايَاتُ فِي سَبَبِ إِلَيْهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ سَلَمَ وَفِي الشَّيْءِ الَّذِي حَرَّمَهُ عَلَى رِوَايَاتِ He says the hadith proves that a man can swear to stay away from his wives. Even though the hadith does not deal with the specific type of ila that is conventional in the books of fiqh, what's meant by ila, that a man swears by Allah not to have sexual intercourse with her. Okay? What's important is the Prophet in this hadith is quoted to have sworn and he stayed away from his wives. All right. Now, um, there are different versions of this hadith. Why did the Prophet do this? Why did he want to avoid his wives and why did he swear to avoid his wives? And there are several different uh, versions of this story. Number one, Ahaduha, Annahu bi sababi if sha'i hafsata lil hadith al-lazi asarruhu ilayha, wa akhtulifa fil hadith al-lazi asarruhu ilayha, akhrajahu al-Bukhari, an Ibn Abbas, an Umara, fi hadith tawil, wa ajmala fi riwayat al-Bukhari hadihi, wa fassarahu fi riwayat al-akhrajaha, al-Shaykhanu bi annahu tahrimuhu li mariyata, وأنه أسره إلى حفصة فأخبرت به عائشة أو تحريمه للعسل وقيل بل أسر إلى حفصة أن أباها يلي أمر الأمة بعد أبي بكر وقال لا تخبر عائشة بتحريم مارية. So the first reason why the Prophet did this, the first interpretation, is that it was the secret that حفصة رضي الله تعالى عنها disclosed. She told other companions something that the Prophet told her not to tell. All right, and obviously that's in Surah to Tahrim. And before we move forward, this is a beautiful example of how Islam is Quran and Hadith, Quran and Sunnah, and that there's much of the Quran you will not understand, you will not get, you will not be able to interpret, you will not be able to practice, you will not be able to make full comprehensible sense out of without the hadiths and without the seerah and without the Prophet ﷺ, his life showing you what Allah is talking about. And remember when the Prophet gave a secret to one of his wives. What secret? How many wives did the Prophet have? Especially in the times in which we live in which um, monogamy is the, the default and the, the, the beginning and the end of the road of marriage. There's no such thing as having more than one wife unless you marry a woman who has one leg or who's 60 years old or on her deathbed or your first wife can't have children because of this tragic accident. She was stabbed with a sword in her, her pelvis and she can't have children, etc. How the people live today. So the uh, Holy Quran says that the Prophet gave a, uh, a secret to one of his wives. Well, why did the Prophet have more than one wife? How could he have more than one wife? Isn't that immoral, nasty, dirty to have more than one wife? And which wife was, etc. It's so many questions you can't answer. You can't understand the Quran properly without the Hadiths. So it goes to show, once, once again, as we've stated before, is that those who reject Hadiths, wholesale rejection, they are kuffar. They are not Muslims, nor are they deserving of the title Qur'ani. I would never give them that title. They're not Qur'anis. They don't respect the Qur'an. They make a mockery and a laughing stock out of the Qur'an. And the ultimate goal, of aside from kufr, people not being Muslim, is to allow the Qur'an to be prey to their desires and whims. Bottom line. Once there's no hadith, no seerah, there's no asbab nuzul, there's no effort involved, we can interpret the Qur'an however we want to in 2022. 
And in 2040, 2050, a new politician, a new war, a new this comes, and we give a new interpretation. Here it means physical war. Here it means just war of oneself, jihad of nafs. And then another time it means war against uh, uh, stinginess, war against racism, war against bigotry. And here this verse means this. And when Moses said to the Israelites that indeed your Lord commands you to slaughter a heifer, what's meant by Tethbahu Bakara is to kill your ego. You know, that's what's meant by uh, God commands you to slaughter a cow because slaughtering cows is inhumane. The vegan movement, it's, it's, it's a bad thing to slaughter a cow just for its skin, just for its hide, just for leather, let alone just for meat. That's, that's, that's Only savage people do that. And the early human beings, whatever you call them, cavemen, Neolithic, whatever the case may be, they only clunked animals upside head and hunted animals, the mammoth, the saber-toothed tiger, because they needed to eat. They needed to stay warm. And we have uh, synthetic leather. We have uh, different fleeces and things that come from plants. There's no need to slaughter animals. There's no need to eat their meat. We can have an, our protein from beans, from mushrooms, okay, uh, from potatoes. We have synthetic meat, beyond meat, etc. Someone will come along and interpret the Quran like that. And this verse that says men should marry women, it, it doesn't have to just mean men and women. A man can marry another man. A woman can marry another woman. There's nothing that's prohibited in the Quran with regards to that. The people of, L of Lot, Sodom, Gomorrah, etc., they were stoned. They were pelted with those stones from heaven because they were raping men. They were highway robbers, etc., etc., etc. So without the hadiths, we can marginalize the Quran and we can do what we want with it. We can play around with it. We can joke around with it. We leave it for the interpretation of any and every person that wants to revamp Islam and the interpretation of the Holy Quran. And that's why hadith rejection is extremely dangerous. Extremely dangerous. It's not a small thing. Once again, anyone who claims that there's no hadith, they're all made up, they're all false, is a kafir. He's not a Muslim. He's made mockery of the Quran, mockery of Allah, disrespect of the Quran, disrespect of Allah, and he himself cannot makes sense. He cannot make any tangible understanding, practical understanding of much of the Qur'an or Kareem. Who is the law speaking about? Who is the law talking to? Rather, who's the prophet? One can ask the question. That verse doesn't say Muhammad and Nabi. So therefore, it's Christ or Moses or Isaac or this one or that one. Who says it's talking about Muhammad? Who's his wife? What's secret? Who did she tell? Etc., etc., right? So, Surah Tahrim goes right here with narration. Is that the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he spoke to Hafsa, he told her a secret, and then unfortunately she told that secret to other people. So, now he says here, um, and obviously the scholars they differ on what is that secret that she disclosed or revealed. One version in Sahih Bukhari states that Abdullah ibn Abbas narrated from Umar in a long hadith, right? Uh, and in other versions as well is that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam made Maria unlawful. Maria, right? The Coptic Egyptian woman that was gifted to the Messenger of Allah Alayhi Salatu Wasallam and the scholars of Islam differ on was Maria his wife or not. All right. Also, and that Hafsa told that to Aisha. All right. She, she, she mentioned that to Aisha. Or, and, or, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam forbidding the drinking of the honey water. I won't drink any asal, I won't have any of it. Others, they say, and this is very interesting, is that the Messenger of Allah told Hafsa that her father, Umar, radiallahu anhu, would be the caliph after Abu Bakr. Your father will be the caliph after Abu Bakr, and that she disclosed that secret. And he, he, or, or he said, do not tell Aisha about Maria, etc. All right. So that is a road within a road. First and foremost, we're talking about why did the Prophet make ilah from his wives? Why did he swear to avoid his wives for, for that period of time? And secondly, what is the secret that the Prophet disclosed to Hafsa or that he told Hafsa about, etc.? Everybody clear on this, inshallah ta'ala? Khairan, inshallah ta'ala. And before we move forward, this goes to show us the importance of discretion in Islam. And in some cases, not all, some, the importance and the need of secrecy and keeping silent 
and keeping quiet, loose lips sink ships, and not to spill the beans and tell someone someone else's secret. Let them, and when people say, don't tell nobody else that I told you this though, I'm gonna tell you. If that person does that to you, nine out of ten times, they do that with your secrets to somebody else. Also, the importance of discretion with regards to husband and wife marriage, let alone husband and wife. In polygyny, a man has multiple wives, the importance of discretion, and the importance of learning how to avoid saying certain things. All right? All right, khair, inshallah, we'll stop here tonight, bidna night ta'ala, and we'll finish that important discussion, hopefully, in next class. Um, and we'll come back after a very short intermission, a tea break, bidna night ta'ala, with regards to some questions. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala surely knows best.